All right, guys. Uh, good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about acute limb ischemia, and we are very privileged to have two uh, senior consultants with us, Dr. Isam Asman, Dr. Hamad. Uh, Isam Asman, of course, guys, everyone, you know him. He's from Shimesi here in Riyadh and trained in, in, uh, in England. And Dr. Mohamed Rafat uh, Jabber uh, from Los Angeles, California. Both are very expertise, vascular surgeons. Uh, guys, any question, please, free, free field to ask him any questions. Okay, Mr. Sam, go ahead and start, please, Mr. Sam. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, 72 years old female presents with uh, a two week history of abdominal pain, abdominal back pain, uh, and lower extremity fatigue. She was evaluated by her physician and diagnosed with lumbosacral neuritis. Initial treatment involved lumbar uh, corticosteroids injections, secondary to sudden. Uh, Onset lower extremity weakness, she presented to the emergency department. Uh, her past history included diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and obesity. In the past month, she had undergone heart catheterization, which was significant uh, for multi vessel coronary artery disease. She denied any prior surgeries. Uh, on examination, her pulse is 75. Uh, pulse uh, beat per minute and blood pressure is uh, 175 uh, over 60. Heart sounds reveal a regular rhythm. The abdomen is uh, soft and non tender. She has absent pulses and diminished strength in both lower extremities. Both feet are uh, uh, insinate. There are venous Doppler signals in the feet, but no arterial signals. Creatinine on, arri on arrival was 0 0.9 milligram per deciliter, and white blood cells count 23,000. Preoperative uh, CTA demonstrates infrarenal aortic occlusion with bilateral renal infarcts. Okay. okay. So very obvious, straightforward case of acute ischemia, and she is 72 years old. First, they thought it is a neurological, but later on, they found it's an acute ischemia, which is a oh. common mistake. You see that even our ER, sometimes patient come with the, you know, weakness in lower extremity and diagnosed by mistake as neuritis, you know, and later on, because nobody put his hand and feel, felt the pulses, and then yeah. later on, that she has an acute ischemia. So this is, you know, I see at least a couple of times like that mistake. So always, guys, anybody comes in, you know, lower extremity weakness, we have to check the pulses. It's very important. All right, uh, let's go to the question. First question. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, native arterial or graft thrombosis can be differentiated from embolic occlusion by the following. Uh, A, the presence of palpable pulses in the contralateral extremity. Okay. Uh, B, a history of cardiac arrhythmias. That is one by one, correct or not? Yeah. Uh, A, yeah, it's uh, in, if it is unilateral, yeah, it's a sign of, uh, we, can, uh, we can consider it as a sign of embolic, yes. Yes, because they have bubble buses. If it's thrombosis, yeah. usually it's usually not RTR disease, so rarely you see yeah. bubble buses on the leg. It's correct. Okay. Yeah. History of cardiac arrhythmias also, it's a, uh, it can be considered as uh, a sign yeah. of uh, embolic, embolic. Okay. The location of the occlusion also, usually if it is at the uh, bifurcation, yeah, it can be a sign of uh, embolic. So, the degree... So so, yes. So in thrombosis, where usually the location will be? Um, uh, distal or uh, yeah, I mean, at the site of uh, calcification or like SFA yeah, or yeah. external iliac or distally. Yeah, usually it's uh, 
classification and muscle based SFA because RSFA is the most artery, you know, disease, you know. So muscle yeah. be due to chronic muscle be CSFA is involved, which is really CSFA in, in, involved with the embolics without common femoral or iliacs, you know. Yes. Also, for the next one. Please. The, the degree of profound ischemia in affected extremity. Yes, also, it can be considered as a sign of uh, embolic because of absence of the collaterals. Okay. Collaterals comes with, come with uh, chronic thrombosis. Uh, e, all of the, of the above. Yes, I will take E. Okay. Uh, uh, so you want to add something, Islam, before we go next? Look straight forward. <laughs> You know, I think that's pretty straightforward, yeah. Okay. One, one thing I can add, the arrhythmia, you know, it's uh, very important to, it's really AFib, that's, uh, it's paroxysmal AFib because patients, they have AFib and then episodes and then comes and goes. And uh, what happens is if if a woman, older woman or older man has paroxysmal AFib, it's very, very suspicious for acute ischemia. It's almost always associated with that, especially specifically if it, you know, because they have periods of uh, normal heart rate, and then that's very important in clue in the history. So uh, I think uh, you have to ask these people if they have atrial fibrillation or not with acute ischemia. So I think. Yeah, I agree. Uh, also, I mean, the reason why if you find a normal rhythm doesn't mean he's he doesn't have an AFib. The reason why usually if he doesn't have history of arrhythmia, we put him on 24 hours halter monitors, you know, to be sure he's not getting an, you know, paradoxal, you know, arrhythmia. Um, all right. Uh, what is got the next question? Do I have much time? Uh, who's around here? Uh, let me see. Usama? Usama, you want to take this, Usama? Yes. Uh, the second question. Uh... Uh, what is the SPC, ISCDS, capability of the ischemia in this patient? Do you know this classification, uh, Sama? Not sure. I know uh, only two classifications, uh, but the fourth classification and... Uh, okay. Anybody you guys know the classification, classification? Especially guys who does that trauma. Anybody knows? Yahya, you know Yahya? I know Dr. Samr, sorry. It's important guys to know that, you know. Uh, category one is almost as normal. Patient has, uh, of course, it's an acute ischemia, no pulses, but sensation and motor function is still intact, you know. So this is like category one. So patient come, he has a cold, like no pulses, but still sensation and motor function is normal. It's category one. Uh, category three is the category two. We have to divide A and B. Category two is that A is when you lose sensation, but you still have motor function. You lose some of sensation, not completely, but you still have a motor function is intact. Uh, you see, by we still have some double signals by ultrasound. Where the B, you become muscle weakness and you lose most of your uh, motor function and the sensation become more profound, so more emergency. Uh, stage three, it's with reversible ischemia. So stage one, you can take your time. Stage three, muscle weakness amputation. Stage two A, you have to do it urgently. I mean, you just lost the sensation or start losing the sensation. So it's not like you have to do it emergency, but urgently, whereas 2B, it's an emergency, because otherwise you can go to 3. Uh, uh, Isam, I know guys if you use this classification. Classification, use different one. No, this is our, we use, um, this is the modified Rutherford classification, because Rutherford initially described this in the early 90s. Um, he didn't include the Doppler signals, and then the SVS and I, ISVS have, added in the Doppler signal. So we use this modified Rutherford classification. This is our routine acute limb ischemia language. What about Rafat? Mohammed, Mohammed Rafat? Maybe you lost him. Yeah, we use the same, the same one. We use yeah. the same classification, yeah. Yeah. So again, I mean, guys, this is an important, you can take, talk the same language. 
when you present the case to the consultant, this is category one, two, or three, you know. Uh, again, the main difference between two and three is the motor uh, function. I think this is, and again, the doublers, when category 2A, you have a doubler in the arterial and venous, where in the category B, you only have the venous, you don't have arterial flow. Uh, so let's go to the next question. Um, yeah, yeah, can I take this question here? Yeah. Hello, Dr. Samra. Okay. What sign differentiate uh, SVS, IS, CVS, category 2A from uh, 2B ischemia? Uh, Balsiness in uh, both in A and B, uh, right. loss, uh, sensory loss, uh, more yeah. in the, affected in both in A and B, but more affected in the B, motor sensory in A only. And B only. All right. Uh, lots of venous doppler signals. No, no, you still have it in. Yeah, the in both still. Three, when you like a reversible ischemia. So really, the motor loss is the main difference between A and B. You know. So again, I mean, the whole idea from this classification to know the urgency of the of the cases. You know. As I say, 2A can urgently where 2B become very like emergency. You have to do it right away, you know. This is the idea from behind this classification. All right, so I don't think much to talk about it here. Let's go to number four. Um, Zahra, you want to take Zahra? Ah, yes, it's good. In acute, lim uh, in acute embolism, the sequences of uh, Events is uh, pulselessness, pain, violet, paresthesia, paralysis, B, paralysis, pain, paresthesia, pulselessness, violet, C, pulselessness, pain, violet, uh, paralysis, paresthesia. Do you remember what the consequences? I mean, I make it easier for you. Paralysis always come before paralysis, paresthesia, correct? So, yeah, I think the, so most probably the last one is wrong because paralysis came before paresthesia, which is wrong. Paresthesia always before. So C is wrong. And B, paralysis, you never saw with paralysis. You usually have a paralysis at the end. So B should be wrong. So A should be the correct. You see, sometimes even you don't know them, just by exclusion, you can tell which one's the right answer. Okay? So the one make a sense is number A. All right. It's not much here. Uh, I think the discussion should go come later on. Let's continue. You can continue, uh, Zahra. Okay, the patient is taking to the endovascular suite and based on the pre-operative uh, CTA, the left groin is accessed utilizing the ultrasound guidance and angiogram is performed from the sheet that reveals an occluded left iliac system with an isolated common femoral artery. A glide wire is traversed through the iliac artery system into the aorta. After confirmation of position, an aortogram is performed. Okay, well, let's see aortogram is aortogram. And you can see here, there's all thrombus, right? You can see in the aorta, okay, almost from the renal below all the way down, full of thrombus. Going to the common iliac, both sides, all, all from us. Okay? Yes. So let's see what's the question. So here, treatment options. What do you think we should do in these patients? Uh, first, before we go, which the category of this guy is? Is this 2A or B? Remember? 2B. 2B, 2B because correct. he has uh, diminished motor and uh, no right. sensation. So okay. So it has our kind of urgent, you know, the emergency. So what kind of treatment? Let's start one by one. What about our to bifat? Or to bifat bypass? It can be done, but it will take a long time. Correct. So it's not the best option, especially when you have an acute yeah. scheme. You know? So it's not be our best option because our to bifat long procedure yeah. already have a scheme already patient advanced. You need something like quick, you know, uh, treatment. So next one. Uh, operative thromboembolectomy. Okay, what do you think about that? Yes. Yeah, this is a good answer. Yeah, yeah, it's 2B and we need to go fast to do embolectomy. How you do it? From right um, or left? 
from the same from the same side. It's but the lateral have, side. So where do you go from? We can use the baron and the contralateral side to detect the contralateral artery, femoral artery, and we can do epsilateral thrombectomy from the uh, from the epsilateral side. Uh, I got lost. So are you going to ex explore the right or left groin, or both? You need to do both, right? Because of water. So you need to, to clean up the from both sides. When you have aortic occlusion, you can do just thrombectomy for one side. Even if the other side is open because the clot can embolize the other side, you know? So you have to do it from both sides. So you be sure you remove that clot from the aorta and both iliac. So you do embolectomy from both the groin. Okay, what about third options? Uh, um, exactly. It will not be the first option. If we fail the... Uh, they did not say... Yeah. They did not say the first option. They said, what the treatment options? Yeah, this is what the treatment option. It can okay. be used uh, later on, not from the first trial. Okay, so the first trial to do thrombectomy. If you cannot take the yes. clot out, then you do exantomical bypass, correct? Yes. Like what? Um, Axial bypass. Yeah. Or... Or you can do fem fem if you are able to open because sometimes you can open only one side. I cannot yes. open so if you can open one side, you get good flow. And for some reason, you cannot clear the other side in the iliac. Of course, the water should be open. If you open the water, clean up one iliac, the other iliac, you cannot do it. Then you can do fem fem bypass. Or if you cannot open any of them, you can do axillo by fem. All right, what about the third uh, fourth option mechanical from back to me? Yeah, mechanical thrombectomy, thrombolysis, and endovascular intervention. It's better to be used in 2A, and this patient has uh, 2B. So the thrombolysis will be oh, delay the treatment in 2B case. I mean, it depends how quick you can go, but I will not say it's a contraindications. I mean, he still has some movement. He only has weakness. He did not lose his you know, motor function completely, you know? Uh, so here he just have some weakness, right? If I remember, let me go back to the scenario again. Yeah, it's diminished, uh, which I remember. Uh, diminished, diminished, diminished things. Diminished things. He's still, he's still moving, you know. Uh, insensible is not station. He still have a double signals, so I think he still have some window. It's not like you cannot say contraindication for thrombolysis. Um, uh, well. So let's finish then we'll take what what about intravenous thrombo thrombolysis? Can we do that? No, um, I'm not sure. Sorry. No, it doesn't work with the arterial. Sometimes it works with the venous with the carotid MI, but it's not the arterial because no flow. So if you give it through the venous, it's not going to go to the to the legs because no flow, you know. So mainly it's good when you have a venous thrombosis. What about last one, anticoagulation with heparin and comedine? No. Not a good option. Uh, all we'll right. We'll start heparin, but we will not treat with heparin. Yeah, but you cannot say, no, that's all treatment, because I see that some yeah. people, not a good idea, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is really a common mistake. We see it here, and so far, we suffer from it, because people, they come with a lower limb ischemia, like subacute, I mean, they still have sensation motor function, and you do a CT angiogram and find a clot like in the iliacs, common iliacs and iliac, but patient for some reason has good collateral, so he still has flow to the legs. So they sit on him and they just give him hip and he improved and send him home. Then he come after a couple months with a severe claudication and the problem or wrist pain, and the problem now is very hard to deal with this kind of patient because the clot is already attached to the wall. It's very hard to remove it, you know? So I never like this approach to just wait, even if the patient improve and you have a clot in the major artery, I think it's better to take it out. Because later on, when they come with a severe codication rest pain, then it's very hard to take it out. It's very hard to be fixed with the, with the endovascular because the is extensive and the patient usually end with a major bypass. So when patient comes with acute ischemia, even if they improve and you see a major clot in the iliac, aorta, femoral, I think it's better to take it. 
within two weeks, of course, if he's still fresh. Uh, Mohamed Rafat, you want to add something, guys, or Isam? Isam, um, if you have anything, you can add it first, if you'd like. Oh, okay, sure. Um, yeah, this is um, an interesting question. And I mean, I have to say, I'm not sure where these questions come from because it seems to be rather vague. Um, I mean, this is a two week history. So it's borderline for uh, acute and borderline acute on chronic. Um, she's diabetic, so she may well have some atherosclerotic disease. And there's no history of any uh, um, arrhythmia. So you could be dealing with an in situ thrombosis of the aortic segment or you could be dealing with something embolic. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, and the first thing is that you wouldn't go straight to angiography, you'd probably go straight to CT. But anyway, you, you're in the OR you're, and you've done the angiography. And it depends where you are. If you're in a hybrid OR and you've done the angiography, then you would want to go for your first choice of thromboembolectomy. Uh, if both iliacs are thrombosed, then you have to open up both femorals to access both iliacs. If you have one iliac thrombosed with the aorta and the other one not too bad, uh, we would often um, just uh, insert a balloon, um, you know, percutaneously up the patent iliac to the bifurcation and to protect it from the embolectomy trash from the other side. And we've done that. We do that with sort of, you know, um, a reasonable success. If that doesn't work, um, then if you are in a hybrid setting, before you go to extra anatomical, you have a number of other options. The mechanical thrombectomy, the penumbra here is very good. I mean, we've had a lot of success with the penumbra, with some TPA as well. And then you, if you find you're left with some disease in the aorta and the iliacs, you've always got the option of stenting left. Um, and if at the end of that, you feel you're still not happy, if you've opened one iliac, as Sam had said, then you can do a fem fem crossover. If you're still struggling, you can do an axilla by fem. Uh, I don't think that there's any room for intravenous thrombolysis in arterial thrombosis, so you should all throw that out of your minds. And if you've got a 2B and anticoagulate with heparin and sit on it, uh, you've not really treated the patient. So those are sort of my initial thoughts um, looking at the question. Over, as I would say. With your Isam, I think, guys, if think if it's uh, acute if it's a chronic is acute on chronic then usually thrombolysis work better because uncover you know the lesion behind it where it's very difficult thrombectomy maybe sometimes to advance the, the, the focality so usually if i think it's a chronic and ac acute on chronic i prefer thrombolysis because this way uncovers the lesion and we can treat it you know because uh, if you have severe cell in the iliac you maybe focality may not even go up to the aorta exactly so, or you can just you know you can but dissect the bed. But yeah. if you think thrombotic, yes, I agree with 100%. But if you think acute on, thro on always I like thr thrombolysis if I could, acute on chronic. And you know, you have a time because good collaterals with acute on chronic. In, in this case, you know, it depends where you are. But uh, uh, for, for instance, this patient has didn't have really acute sudden onset symptoms. So he had symptoms for two weeks. So and he came walking and he had some deficiencies. So... It's borderline to use uh, thrombolysis after two weeks. The cutoff is two weeks usually. We've used it. I've used it more than two weeks. But I think, you know, depends where you are. If you have a good vascular unit and a good observation and people really on top of things, you can use thrombolysis a little bit and see how they do. And especially if you have now newer, uh, not newer, but you have some the thrombolysis like ecosystem where you have ultrasound guided and you need only six hours to break the clot. You can then bring them back and see what they got. And like Dr. Isam said, you know, if there's residual lesions, you can treat those in the vascular or open, you know. So, um, but also you can do open. All options said are good options, you know. But um, uh, the trickiest one is the thrombolysis here. Then depends where you're at, you know, which facility you're at, you know, I think. I think Dr. Kabiz, he has his hand up. Uh, go ahead, Mohammed. Uh, Dr. Samuel, first of all, I just wanted to ask you, uh, 2A, we usually, when we say 2A, it's just only affecting the big toe, and for 2B, uh, it's affecting more than the big toe, uh, like the forefoot. So this is kind of accepted when we are discussing the cases? What do you mean accepted? Do you mean the classification? Yeah, or I mean, 
when let's say I'm uh, your registrar and inform you about the case, I would say 2A is just affecting only the big two. Such terminology mentioning that it's only affecting the big two is accepted and understood from. Uh, so no, the 2A is when you have a start losing mild sensation decrease, whereas 2B is a four foot sensation, you lose four foot sensation. But mm -hmm. two it's when you see mild decrease in sensation, but you have a normal motor function, really. Uh, so this is the difference between, so the main really difference between both of them is a, is a motor function, you know? When you can start seeing weakness, a motor function decrease, then you start to talk about 2B. But again, but in this case, because been going for two weeks, so most of this is an acute on thrombosis, you know, from acute on chronics. Mm -hmm. So he has a lesions here, and now is to do open thrombectomy or thrombolysis. The cutoff is, Dr. Mohammed Rafat said, is two weeks, which is a cutoff. But now we are the, at the edge. So maybe some people, they may push for thrombolysis. Uh, some people, they may just take it for open thrombectomy. But expect if you do open thrombectomy, you may not be able to advance, you know, the forgotty because severe iliac disease or severe aortic distal aortic stenosis. So you may end doing like a bypass. So, so again, because it's two weeks, you know, and patient is not bad because acute and chronic, I still have sometimes at least to throw a try thrombolysis. Uh, so you can try that, but it depends how your setting, of course, you know, but it has to be quick, you know, if you don't want to lose more time. All right, let's see what's it here. Who's going to continue? So this is a patient here, the same picture. After thrombo, uh, the thrombolysis, let me see what they did here. Okay, so question, after thrombolysis, long-term outcome is, so it looks they did thrombolysis. I didn't mention that. Did I missing any part? No, honestly, that's what I would do probably in this case. If in our facility, I would do a thrombolysis, but you have to watch him carefully. So if any, if they go south, you know, you have to take them to the war, but... Uh, well, let's talk, let's talk about thrombolysis. I think this is the most part here before we go different. Uh, yeah, thrombolysis here. Uh, first, let me ask the guys if anybody knows uh, what's the dose we give it and what's the approach. You go from one side, from both sides. Uh, anybody, guys, is a fellow, knows? Uh, I will go from this side. Uh, please, if I'm in pain tester, push one milligram per, uh, per hour. Uh, there's other protocols. Uh, of two milligrams per hour and uh, get the patient back again uh, in eight to 12 hours for a second look and see. Along this time, if it is becoming worse, I would just go for uh, uh, the DC and see what's really going on. Mohammed, you said the dose is one, two? One milligram actilase uh, per hour. And what the maximum dose? <laughs> Maximum dose uh, is four milligram, but this would be very high dose and no, no, no. for a limited time, six hours for four milligram uh, per hour. Uh, I've never used the four milligram per hour, but uh, there was one consultant back in Egypt who used four milligram per hour for only six, eight hours and then get the, back, the patient back. Uh, in the center I have worked, the usual dose would be going for one milligram per hour and have a second look uh, DSA uh, in uh, 12 hours. In the UK also, it's kind of different. In the USA, they don't do thrombolysis in such circumstances. They'll just get the patient, do plain simple embolectomy. If it didn't work, they'll but, go on with him and that's it. Okay, well, let's let's talk you know, when here, because we have a lot of fellows with us, we have, a, you know, so we have to talk what the protocol, what's the guideline, not what we do. We do a lot of things, you know, out of guideline. What is the guideline for thrombolysis? What's the dose? Anybody know? One milligram per hour. And can you go higher? Yes, up to two milligrams. No, not really, no. Two milligrams, you talk about the venous. You're confusing arterial with the venous. Usually the arterial is 0 0.5 to 1. Rarely, rarely you go more than, I mean, I'll ask the other guys, but it's my knowledge is the maximum you go to one. Mm -hmm. Venous, you can go to one to two because you have more clot, more burdens. But as an arterial, you, you can, you know, go up to one milligram. And how long you can go? For how long? 48 hours. Okay. Can you go longer? 
not preferably uh, and in arterial system it is not preferred at all uh, okay yeah, can, but this would be out of the guidelines oh correct guidelines 48 hours but some people they go 72 hours but guideline is 48 hours okay do you yes. give him do you give heparin with it yeah slow uh, uh low dose in the cheese heparin would be like four 200 up to 400 uh, international units per hour in the cheese not systemic not iv Okay, so we don't give any IV heparin, systemic. Yeah. Only through yeah. the sheath. Only through the sheath, 200 up to 400 units of heparin. Just to prevent sheath thrombosis. Exactly. Because otherwise, you have a chance yeah. of bleeding. All yeah. right, let's see another guy's protocol. Correct, this is a protocol. So 0 0.5 to 1 milligram per hour. You can go 48 hours. You can push the gain 72, but usually 48 hours. What happens if, like, in the middle of the night, uh, what are you going to watch? How you watch the thrombolysis? What do you, you look for? I'll be looking for the... What do you, uh, what do you ask to do? Yeah, patient ICU, what does the nurse to do in the ICU? What do you monitor for? Uh, I'll be looking for the groin bleeding every hour to see if there's any bleeding through the, uh, through the groin. Uh, watch out for the uh, uh, ops. Blood pressure is very sensitive and the heart rate also. Uh, Pain-wise, the patient would need painkillers. Clinically, I would be following the patient uh, for foot signal. And if the pain is getting higher and the, clinically the foot is getting worse, then this seems will not be will not be working, especially in the aorta. If it's peripheral going downstream, uh, thrombolysis, it usually goes very bad and then starts to be better. Uh, but if the foot is clinically bad, it's 2B after all. So if the, if the clinical signs uh, too bad, uh, I would go for, uh, and do something. In, in such instances, I was just thinking of uh, uh, mechanical thrombectomy. Percutaneous mechanical thrombectomy would help us and decrease the time for thrombolysis. Also, uh, yeah. It's just okay. when you are dealing with aortic thrombus and uh, thrombolysis. That's the idea. Well, let's go back to the main question I asked you. How do you manage the vision? So you said you also a patient, you check the pulse, you check the legs. What about the lab? Do you order any lab? APTT uh, and fibr uh, fibrinogen level. The fibrinogen level, if it's becoming consumed, then we are in serious problem. It's not working, it's, uh, it's working too much. Okay, so you have very important, you have to write the order, you have to follow the fibrinogen. Go so for fibrinogen went down, then you have to stop it, you know? Lower than what? What do you write for them? If fibrinogen went down, lower than what? You know what's the number? I don't quite remember the number. I'm sorry. It's 100. If you go lower than 100, then you have to stop the TBA. Okay. 100. 100. Yeah. Uh, DL, Bermuda. I believe 90. Sorry? In Venus, uh, I believe we go for, for, for 90, less than 90. Is that right or, not, or wrong? Maybe it's different protocol, but I know less than 100. Anything go below than 100, you have to be concerned about it, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so you have to look for fire. For that, you have to look for hemoglobin. But sometimes if internal bleeding, you don't know. So you have to watch the hemoglobin. You have to get the hemoglobin every like six or eight hours, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's very important to write for the nurse to check the hemoglobin, the fibrinogens, and the other thing, mental status. It's very important. You know, if he has changed his mental status any time, you have to think about intracranial bleeding. So you have to alert the nurse. If any change in mental status, she should let you know, okay? Yes. Because it's hard to write it down when you write that. During thrombolysis, the leg get better, but sometimes they just suddenly get worse because small emboli go distal. In this situation, it's better to increase the dose for only two, three hours. Because, and always remember, this emboli already has a TBA, will dissolve by themselves. So increase the TBA after one or two hours. If you don't improve, then you have to take them to surgery. But usually it gives them some time, increase the dose and wait like an hour. Usually they improve by themselves, okay? That's very nice. So don't rush to surgery right away. Give them at least an hour, increase the dose and wait and see. Because what happens is sometimes the clot fragmented and go down distal, includes the artery, tibial, or, you know, and then patients suddenly become very cold, the leg, you know? But remember, this emboli already has a TBA inside, so it will dissolve later on. So just give it some time. But if it does not dissolve, then you have to take him to the wall. Okay? Okay. I think I talked too much. Let uh, Isam and uh, Dr. Hamad Rafat talk. Uh, yeah. Isam, please. Yeah, I mean, what we're talking about is uh, the low-dose uh, intra-arterial thrombolysis regimen. Um, 
Uh, we start off, I mean, you know, back in the early 2000s, it was very fashionable to thrombolize a lot. Um, and then we came back and we readjusted to, to a bit more of a balanced situation. We, we used to start off with half a milligram per hour for six hours and then go to one milligram per hour. We rarely exceeded that. We didn't like to go on beyond 32 hours for intra-arterial thrombolysis. We'd come back for a check angiogram and maybe reposition the catheter. Uh, we did not bother with fibrinogen levels. Um, uh, I'm not sure that um, uh, there's much evidence to support, the, by, al although I know the Americans talk about it, um, 150, 100, whatever, but we, we didn't really worry about it. Um, the important things to look for are the commonest complications, bleeding around the puncture site. Um, and the nurse is keeping an eye on that. Obviously, the disaster is an intracerebral hemorrhage. And many patients will, will tell you the pain is getting worse, but they have a warmer foot. And that's uh, sometimes what we call reperfusion pain. But uh, many patients will embolize. And like you said, if they do embolize, we would then probably come back, look at repositioning the catheter, increasing the dose for a short time. And if it doesn't get better, then we would abandon um, and, and try to retrieve the clot surgically. Um, I must say, pure thrombolysis now we don't do very often. It's usually an adjunct with pharmacomechanical thrombectomy with the new devices. In particular, we use the penumbra a lot because um, it shortens the time. The problem with the penumbra is that blood loss was quite heavy. Um, they have a new one, which we haven't got yet here, where the blood loss is less. Maybe Mohammed can tell us about that. Um, so that you know, that's um, um, that's my experience with thrombolysis uh, uh, over the years. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. the I'm, I'm sure the fibrinogen point will be controversial. <laughs> There's a question here from Hamad Ahmed. He said uh, ESVS 22 for ALI guidelines said follow up with fibrinogen level is not recommended. But this is always a uh, you know problem between European and American you know recommendation. I know Rafat, what do you think? Do you need to? Yeah, follow I check up? it. I check it at least uh, not. Uh, I check it at least once a day because, I mean, that's uh, what I'm used to do. And uh, all complications that we've had, you know, uh, I used to have somebody who I trained with before. Uh, it goes below hundred, he's give cry or continue. And these patients that they have head bleeds and all of that. So they say this, it is controversial, but I think, you know, uh, once a day to check, to see how you're doing, because it also guides you whether your thrombolysis is working or not. Uh, you know, if your fibrinogen level is 400, you know, you're probably not doing anything, you know, so you probably have to up the dose. So it is controversial, but I think it's very, very commonly done uh, in many people. Uh, many people do that now, but it is not recommended the guideline. I agree with the gentleman, but it's really useful, very useful to guide your therapy. I think in in some ways, you know, and uh, uh, to prevent disasters like head bleed and all of that. So, and I, I use it. I use it once a day at least to see what how how am I doing with my TPA uh, infusion. So, yeah, okay. Do you still use your your Canadian state or only TPA? I use TNK or TPA. That's uh, the the two things that we use. And TPA most commonly TPA now nowadays recombinant uh, uh, tissue plasminogen, plasminogen, and it's pretty good. And uh, you know it has uh, a good tolerance. Uh, you can reverse it if you need to go to the OR uh, quickly. Uh, so I, that's what we use mainly. Um, but I'm going to go back to this case. I, uh, Muhammad said uh, you go from one side. In this case, I'd go probably from both sides. And I do, like Dr. Isam said, I'd probably split the dose into half, 0 0.5 milligram and 0 0.5 milligram on each side. And then, you, you know, you load the two catheters above in the aura. That's probably what I would do. I would not just do one side on this one, you know, because you have clot on the left iliac and you'll have more, uh, more uh, uh, lysis, basically. And if you have penumbra or penumbra, is a, you know, it's very helpful here too, you know. So I think you decrease the burden of the clot and uh, decrease the duration of TPA as well. Uh, Mohammed, uh, ask, ask a question. Have you used the new one where they say... I used it, yeah, I used it. It decreases blood flow. It decreases the blood loss for sure, loss. you know. Yeah, yeah but still, still, if you're not careful, you lose quite a bit. But it, it's not anything like before. I mean, to suck that clot out, you probably lose a, three units of blood, you know, in the process. Honestly, so so you have to be very careful, you know. 
And uh, with the sheath bleeding, you know, there's a trick that I've learned before. Uh, you know, you, some people, uh, they make a small uh, cut in the skin. When you, If you do a lysis, don't do that. You know, just try to put the sheath, you know, without putting a cut if you can. Sometimes you can't, but, uh, you know, you can dilate with the dilator and then go back again with the sheath. Uh, if you if you can if you if you can avoid that, that would save a lot of uh, groin uh, bleeding complications and saves a lot of calls from nurses as well. So, well, let me ask you a question, guys. If you're doing your, like open thrombectomy, you still have like clot distal, like in in the like TBL, you know, arteries. After you do open thrombectomy, do you try to do like from on table thrombolysis, like for yeah. Does it, you do that? Yeah, definitely. It, it, it definitely it, it helps a lot. You know, you, we put uh, two milligram or you know two, two to four, but two milligram I usually put, and I wait about five minutes. It helps a lot. Okay, you just inject it distally, right? It's I, not like it I get an angiocath or some uh, uh, atraumatic catheter and just inject it. You know, I usually do when I when I do thrombectomy, I put vessel loops up, and then that way you can you know put a, a cath and. Uh, and basically inject it in there, yes, and uh, I do that. It's, it's very helpful. You wait like 20 minutes or no? No, no five minutes, five, five? minutes. Oh, okay. Five, you 10 minutes, yeah. You still not, no, the, the, the TPA is good about it. It's a very short half-life. Half-life is about half hour, and okay. they have reversible agents. So let's say this patient, you know, in the ICU got worse and uh, he, st he stopped moving his leg. You know, sometimes I've had a situation like that once at least before, where a patient completely went, like, you know, could not move the leg and full-blown ischemia. So we had to do surgery on the patient. So you, a reversal agent for uh, TPA is uh, aminocarboric acid, you know, so you give these patients, you know, uh, aminocarboric acid and you take them to the OR. And then if you wait half hour, the half-life, it, it wears out also. So that's the good thing about TPA. And it starts very quickly as well. So... Uh, Dr. Rafat, uh, Dr. Saber, may I ask you two questions, actually? Uh, going through the right groin, which is the affected limb, if you found an iliac lesion, which direction would be going? You would be going retrograde, and if you found an iliac lesion, would you balloon it and stent it with a bare metal stent if it needs, or just balloon it and push the fountain? That's one question. The other question, if we place the sheath, do some blood from both sides, the next day you still have a problem with the downflow, an interface thrombus or a popliteal thrombus that needs to push the wire and the fountain more distally how you are going to deal with it, with this sheath into your way. And would the, would you go on and keep the, the both sheaths and the fountain push it further downwards? How to arrange it? So, go ahead, go ahead Dr. Samir. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, please, go ahead. Can I yeah, so I've, I've had a case, actually, I can maybe put it on, show you, I've had a situation like that where actually the patient had cold leg on one side and had a clot and then they had also bilateral iliac stents occlusion. So in this case, you know, you have to go from both sides, in my opinion. And then, you know, you're not going to use, if you put a, a, a TPA catheter, you're not going to use a big sheath. You're not going to, unless you use a penumbra, you know, uh, that's an eight French sheath. But most most of the time, if you use just TPA, five French sheath is enough. So that's not going to be occlusive. But if you have a thrombus down below, uh, you know, you can tackle that with anti-grade stick, but that's more risky, you know, but, uh, or you can just cut down and do it, you know, uh, after you've done. But the main thing is, uh, is I think, you know, is, uh, is, is using low profile sheaths, so, you know, prevent these complications. And TPA, remember, dripping down on both legs, so so it's unlikely that you're going to have a significant uh, uh, thrombus uh, shower in there, you know, but it can happen, so. So I agree. I mean, I mean as I, if I understood the question correct, that you have an axis in both the groin and now thrombus when distal, you want to 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 follow up this, you give thrombolite to this clot. I mean, one option, you can leave the sheath on both sides. From one side, you go contralaterals and you put your lysis sheath there for 24 hours. Or the other option, you can take the sheath out, but put, you have to put a closure device, but it has to be successful, you know. I think this may work, you know. But if you want to be you can leave as it's five French, you can leave it there and get a catheter next to it and go all the way down the foot and give thrombolysis. Mm -hmm. yeah, it depends how comfortable you are also with anti grade access. Anti grade access, if you're not comfortable, don't do it, you know, because uh, it has more complication. But if you're comfortable, like I, for instance, I hardly go up and over with, when I do angios, just I'm used to do anti grade access. 
the you know you can do the or like Dr. Samir said, you can put a catheter and wire down there and do it that way. So but sometimes you know patients are very obese, it's very hard to integrate, you know, or high bifurcations. But right. yes, after mm -hmm. yes, you can do it, yeah. All okay. right. Uh, if you have a, a, a problem with an iliac artery, and the, the wire can pass or hardly pass, and then pushing the fountain is very difficult. Would you go balloon this and just balloon it or balloon and stent and keep the uh, fountain up and go on with thrombolysis? What, how would you approach such problem? So if you can't get a wire, you can't balloon, you know. So you have to get a wire in, through. No, I mean, you got the wire, but still mm -hmm. while you're pushing the, your fountain, five French fountain pushing, you can push it really, uh, uh, and there is some stenotic lesion uh, there. Would you balloon it and keep the thrombolysis going? Uh, no. no. Any intervention should be done after, in my opinion, any intervention should be done after you finished. You said, I'm not going to do any thrombolysis. Then you do intervene because you don't want to, you know, once you balloon, you can shower clot, you know, so um, there's no need to, inter you don't know. So you, you, the reason to do a thrombolysis is it decreases the magnitude of your procedure. So, you know, you can say, okay, we'll do a by FM for this guy and we're done. But by doing thrombolysis, you know, you decrease the magnitude of what you need to do later on. Therefore, you know, you don't intervene until you're done with thrombolysis. You say, okay, that's the clot. Most of the clot is gone. And then you balloon and you have to be very careful. And then I heard you saying bare metal stints. In these situations, it's a little, little bit more expensive to do a cover stent, but if you have any questions about clots, it's probably better to do a cover stent, unless, unless you're crossing the uh, you know, hypogastric artery. That's the only time I wouldn't do is cover stent in this type of situation, but cover stent will actually trap the clot as well, so it won't shower. Um, yeah. yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you don't fix anything before you finish thrombolysis, because if you put any stent, this will be thrombosed, yeah, because you don't have an outflow. So if you yeah. put any stent, and this and if you balloon it and you may end with showering down so i will not i mean if you can get you usually get cut you don't have to get your sheet you just get your catheter finish your thrombolysis after you're done with every thrombolysis at the end you can do the interventions you know uh mm -hmm. either covering a balloon and cover it depends what the region you see it you know but if you still find like a clot there because sometimes they have like a thick clot stuck there like you know chronic clots uh so sometimes you need to tag it with a stent, you know? Yep. Okay. We're, we're, we're talking about th thrombolysis. Uh, um, I mean, certainly the availability of a hybrid operating room has changed our practice dramatically, Sam. Um, I mean, um, Mohammed is saying sometimes you can't get through with a Fogarty, but now we're using Fogarty's on wires. Um, and, and, and what we'll do is, is we'll try the thromboembolectomy first then we'll get as much clot as we can. Then we'll take a picture after that and uh, in the hybrid. And then we'll often wind up stenting um, uh, the residual disease with covered stents. Um, and that way you avoid, uh, um, you know, the thrombolysis. Um, uh, you know, I still believe that in the, in the long term, this outcomes of treatment of acute limb ischemia are better with surgical and endovascular sort of... Um, uh, interventions rather than thrombolysis. Uh, you may have a lower mortality with thrombolysis, but they wind up in trouble later on. So to put a, a catheter in and, and thrombolyze in the aorta for 24, 72, hour, 48 hours, there is a real risk of distal embolization, which may not thrombolyze. Um, um, you, you may have to go after it to surgically after that. The other thing you, you mentioned about on table completion thrombolysis with the crural vessels. Um, in fact, we had a case yesterday aortic thrombus, iliac thrombus, SFA thrombus, crural thrombus, and we wound up in a young woman chasing. I've, I have to admit that I've always found, I do it, I give uh, TPA down into the crural pedal arch and wait, um, I wait 20 minutes, Mohammed. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, but, um, um, and I give a sort of a man-sized dose, <laughs> I give five milligrams, yeah. Um, oh. yeah. I, I, it's always been disappointing for me. I, you know, I, I've never done it and thought, oh, wow, that's really uh, made a big difference. Unless I'm doing a bypass, I, unless I'm, I'm shooting um, TPA distal to where I bypassed um, and I just want to clear up any, any sludge. So, you know, now we're more prone to doing microtibial embolectomies. So, you know, we'll open up the, the arteries at the ankle and put the Fogarty up from below. Um, I think an anti-grade 
embolectomy is often um, you know, quite easier and better to do than a retrograde embolectomy from the top down because you're coming with the flow, so the blood is pushing clot out with you. And we'll pass the two Fogarty into, into the pedal arch to try to get some clot from there, and then, we'll, and then we'll give TPA into the pedal arch. But um, it doesn't seem to be as, as, as rewarding as everybody says it is, uh, certainly in our hands. Um, and well, uh, I, I would not thrombolize after a stent. Um, uh, the stenting, the intervention is on the way out, never on the way in. Um, yeah, it depends. Uh, it depends where you are and how you're comfortable with things. I we used to cut down on the tibia and the you know below knee doing thrombectomy. I haven't done that in many years now. Like you said, there are pro Fogarty's over the wire, you know, the hybrid approach and things like that. I've I've used I use a TPA extensively and I've had a pretty good outcome, especially you know, when you have you know, uh, like this type, this case, definitely, I personally would probably use the TPA for this particular case. Uh, but you're right. I mean, you know, sometimes putting a Fogarty, you know, it just saves a lot of time. But also this comes with a cost, you know. Sometimes you can damage and dissect and do things like that, you know. So there's no question in my mind that when the, in the right setting and the right indication, a TPA or uh, thrombolytic will uh, will decrease the magnitude of whatever surgery you're going to do, you know. So um, especially in the pedal arch, for example, TPA would work probably probably better than uh, thrombectomy because you know you can spasm, you can do things, you can damage, you can dissect. But if you have experience with this, um, that's why you, the setting that's also is acceptable, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, I hope it works for this lady yesterday because uh, we left the table after seven hours, not really happy. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this, the other thing, a lot of our patients have got thrombophilias, so so that's another... Mm -hmm. stiff, yeah. yeah. Ah, it's, um, I don't know if I didn't hear you, you said that surgical thrombectomy is better than thrombolysis? No, I no. no. What I said, well, you mean for the iliacs or where are we talking about? General, I mean, in general, I mean, from I mean, because yeah, all the yeah, yeah. If you if you look at the the trial, the evidence of those trials, the Topaz trial, and there was another trial, right. Right. Uh, which looked at the long term outcomes. Um, the the thrombolysis had lower mortality in the first thirty days, but right. if you follow up, more were losing their legs. But uh, if you survived your 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 surgical revascularization, you tended to do better in the long term. That that was sort of the gist of it, and and in the end. People balanced, you know, we because we went, I mean, I don't know, maybe you were doing it, but in the UK in the early 2000s, everybody was thrombolizing acute limb ischemia. You know, nobody was doing anything surgical. And then, uh, you know, we got the results of this trial and, and then we swung back again. Um, so that's why, you know, uh, we were doing a lot of it. But it's a balance. It's a balance. Um, and you all you need is one patient to have an intercerebral hemorrhage, yeah, on thrombolysis. And it clouds your judgment. <laughs> and and I've had one. I, I've had a patient bleed into their head that we thrombolized to a 78 year old, and uh, sadly she died. Um, so I, I, I'm very cautious with TPA. Very cautious with TPA. Unfortunately, was, this happens also, you know. But we've had all Fogarty's where, you know, you did three vessels, tibial vessels, and then you knocked one out or two outs, you know, with the just doing a thrombect, you know, thrombectomy too. So. It's a really balance. It's a, it's a just, it's, you know, we're, we're in risky business and there are complications. You have to be very careful, you know, and uh, unfortunately head bleed that can happen. You know, that's why you have to be very careful with dosing and select the right patients, I think. Uh, again, also, I think the age of the thrombus make a huge difference. I think when you have a thrombus less than 14, I think thrombolysis will work beautiful. When you go more than two weeks, I think you lose, you wasting your time. I think surgical thrombectomy will give you a much, much better uh, outcome. Yeah, and which, is why, which is why in this particular case, at two weeks, I, I'd be pushed towards the balloon rather than the lysis. But if it was four or five days, then yes, it does dissolve much easier. Yeah. All right, let's keep moving. Mountain uh, Ahmed. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Ahmed, go ahead. How they did here. Okay, Ahmed Mountain. Yes, Dr. Sam, should I read this one? Uh, this patient underwent lysis from left to groin with uh, 20 centimeters infusion catheter. Thrombolysis, TBA, uh, dose with 1 milligram per hour, was performed through a multi-site hole infusion catheter. And the following day, there was a, a significant resolution of thrombus in the water left common iliac system. I, I, 
Yeah, Let's that's see. the system. Yeah, the iliac looks beautiful. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's go back. Okay, then. Okay, then uh, a, 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 then a combination of hydrophilic choir and catheter used to cross the legion and the rise common iliac system and gain access to the native femoral system. A second infusion catheter was placed through the this occlusion and thrombolytic therapy was continued. After another 24 hours of therapy, the patient was returned to the endovascular suite. While there was significant improvement, there was still residual thrombus in the origin of the right hypogastric artery and right external iliac artery. Yes, Thrombolytic therapy, yeah, the external is still occluded. I have a lot of thrombus internal and external, okay. And notice in the right side is no internal, you're right? On the no side. internal, no hypogastric, true. Okay. So it was continued. While now. there was a significant improvement, there was still residual thrombus at the origin of the right hypogastric artery and the right external iliac artery. Thrombotic therapy was continued another 24 hours at 0.5. Okay. I mean, just guys remember is that this is just somebody wrote this case. Doesn't mean this is, everyone does different. Yeah, I agree with Rafat, Hamid, I told Muhammad Rafat that I will do both groin. I will not do this way technique. I will go from both groin right away and thrombolize a water and both come on iliac artery. This guy, he did, I know why he did this way. He went from one side and then he crossed the other side and did the thrombolysis, which is good to be done. I think he's trying to keep the dose down, isn't he? Um, Maybe he doesn't want to much. You can split the dose. You know, you can split the dose. I, I, one of my partners use uses zero point two five and works for him. I, I don't know how, but you can use two. You can split the dose to zero point five if you have two catheters. You know, and uh, yeah, definitely, I would probably that's probably not the best thing to do to go from one side to the, another. Here. Well, let me ask you if you, if this patient has come up from artery also occluded on both sides, would you go from brachial and profunda is open? You can definitely go from brachial, yeah. You know, I've I've had uh, I mean, I don't want you to, I don't want the, the trainees and you think that I do a, a lot of open surgery, but sometimes if you have a bypass, you know, uh, uh I've, I've gone through through both brachial, you know, one times, you know, and I do you can do, but you have to be very careful with the access also. You know, on the break here. Yeah. All right. You... Yes, sir? You can do, uh, and we've done it before. We, we had problems with bleeding from the puncture site in the arm, mm -hmm. and we've had compartment syndromes in the upper arm, and you know. So it's... you have to be super careful with the break, and don't do just a break. You know, at the uh, I do I, I do have high break in these in these cases. You know. I, with ultrasound, very careful, you know. Okay. Uh, we forgot to answer this question. Uh, Ahmed, can you answer it after thrombolysis? Yeah, after thrombolysis, uh, long-term outcome is predicted on A, unmasking a culprit's legion that is treated by either endovascular or surgical means. It makes sense. Right. Okay. And the second is the dose of thrombolytic agent used. I don't think it's correlated. Because it's talking about long term. Yeah. Neither is the duration of thrombolysis itself. Okay. Uh, outflow makes sense. Uh, if we have an outflow obstruction, the reocclusion rate is higher. If we take the chronic cases, I'm not sure about acute ones. And E, assuring all acute thrombus is lysed. Very important, right? Yeah. If you leave a thrombus, there will be thrombus. So be yeah. sure the thrombus being lysed. You know, the reason why when you do a thrombectomy, always guys, you have to do a completion angiogram, even do surgical. Don't depend on retrograde flows. I see a lot of people, they say, oh, we have a retrograde flow, we are fine. No, always you have to do an angiogram. I'll be surprised what you find. Sometimes you find dissection from the forgot, you find a lot of clots still there. So whoever does thrombectomy without angiogram, I don't think they are doing a good job, and most of them come back with thrombosis. So it's very important to do a completion angiogram in every case to do thrombectomy. All right, so Ahmed, what is, I mean, uh, Isam, he mentioned one of them. What are the three main trials, guys, you have to read about it, about thrombolysis comparing uh, surgical thrombectomy? I'm aware of the topaz, but it was an old one, 1996, I think, phase one. I'm not okay. sure about the rest. We have a Rochester, right? And we have style. 
trial. Uh, and all of them, they showed, again, I mean, really on the short term, if you lay down 14 days, again, thrombolysis is better, but on the long term, it's no different, really. Even in the in mortality, is no different. And uh, amputation free survival is no difference, you know. So the reason why Islam, he said, now we move back to the thrombectomies, you know. But uh, on the short term, if it's less than 14 days, uh, thrombolysis showed this uh, better uh, amputation, free survival, uh, and less chance. Of, and even your surgery, as Dr. Muhammad Rafat mentioned that, if you have to do a surgery, it will be less invasive surgery if you do thrombolysis first, because you end with a small lesion you need to be fixed with the endovascular or surgery. Where if you go from the beginning, you may end with a major surgery. Uh, anything guys need to add about this trial or uh, I, yeah, I, think, I think these trials are really interesting, but they're probably now of historical interest. So with the advent of, of hybrid endovascular surgical interventions, um, you lies, you have a residual lesion, you stent, you angioplasty. I, I think that's changed things a lot. Um, so, so maybe it's time to re relook at them again in, in, in a different setting. Um, I still feel thrombolysis really, if it's no major contraindication, I think it, I still think it, it clean up the arteries much better than surgery, you know. Right. I still have, you know, you get a better, you know, because in Socrates you cannot clean everything, where thrombolysis you can really clean a lot of arteries, small clots, you know. So I still feel that thrombolysis should be first line if you don't have already advanced ischemia or like 2B or something like that. You agree, mm -hmm. guys? I agree. Yeah, the, the you know the technology, the thrombectomies, uh, Prambra, it's not perfect. You know, it's Prambra is perfect in a patient. You have let's say, you have a patient with a just a popliteal clot. You know, that's a case you already do Prambra and you, you're done. But if you have extensive clot like that, um, uh, you know, I think the thrombolysis, like Doctor Samir said, is uh, cleans up the vessel better and makes the magnitude of whatever procedure you do later less. You know, and um, and they are, you know, there are catheters where you can suck the clot out of the pedal vessels and things like that, such as, you know, Pronto and Export, and these are cardiologists used, you know, but we don't really use much of them. We just inject TPA, and most people just get better, you know, after what once you do the main lesions, you know, afterwards. So, um, but yeah, well, the, the, I, I think to, um, um, to, to, to answer that question, I, I think it depends which vessel you're talking about, first of all. So I think the aerotoiliac segment behaves differently from the femoral popliteal and the coral segment. Sure. Um, yeah. I think the smaller the vessel, the more I'm in favor of thrombolysis. Yeah. Um, uh, so you know, if we're dealing with something down of the popliteal artery, uh, you stick a catheter down, lies, you'll find next morning it's dissolved. Everybody's happy. The second thing is it's it's very difficult sometimes to differentiate between uh, embolism and in situ thrombus, uh, right. although we yeah. Although we think we can, um, and and thrombolysis, trying to thrombolyze an embolus is is uh, is difficult, as you know. Um, uh, so I, I still, for me, the autoiliac segment with a hybrid capability, um, I, I would still look at trying to do a thromboembolectomy first, knowing that if there's any residual disease or clot, I can I could stand. Uh, and below the knee, um, if it's an isolated popliteal area, then I would thrombolize. Um, uh, so, and the other thing about this case, which is unusual that we've not really discussed is if this is in situ thrombus of the infrarenal aorta, why are there bilateral renal infarcts? That for me would favor uh, uh, an emb embolization scenario rather than a thrombosis right. scenario. Yeah. Right. Certainly, you know, your approach is certainly uh, is acceptable. It's a good approach, too, you know. So there's uh, trainees also need to know that there's more more than one way of doing things, you know. But that's a definitely perfectly okay approach, you know, also. So to do a thrombectomy in the aura. Uh, but, you know, with, uh, it depends where you are and what you're comfortable with. You know, lysis also is okay in this case. I think that both solutions are perfectly okay, you know, in, in my opinion. You know, it depends how you, what your approach is. And what you're comfortable with, and how much complication you want to keep, you know, put up with the growing complications and things like that, you know. So, but it's perfectly okay, I think, too. Can you do thrombolysis in a pregnancy? You can do in the in the latter part of pregnancy, yeah, yeah. Um, I've done a, I've done a few for ileofemoral DVTs in late pregnancy, yeah. Okay. 
Last question, guys. If it's no outflow, can it still do thrombolysis? If it's no outflow. The question is, will it, will it stay open after thrombolysis when there is no outflow vessel? No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that uh, this is for senior, not for you. That if you have no outflow, SFA occlude, BTL, TV, everything is occluded from below. Can you still do thrombolysis? Because there's no place to go down. Not unless uh, you bring, not unless you want to dissolve all the clot. If you leave clot distally, it'll just clot off again. And and you will not make any significant improvement in the perfusion of the limb if your runoff is occluded. Well, uh, you know, it depends what, again, you know, for, for instance, this is a perfect example for occlusion of popliteal area aneurysm, acute occlusion, you know, so... So there's an actually a catheter called end-hold catheter where you have the hole at the end of, of that. And what you do with this, if, again, it should be guided by the motor function. If the patient has good, you know, has motor function still, and we go back to the two, you know, two A and two B. But if you have somebody who had acute occlusion of a popliteal area aneurysm and no, no outflow, the standard of care here, at least in the US, to go in with thrombolysis and put a, an end-hold catheter, what you said, you just put it in the popliteal area and you go. And then you come back, and most of the time you'll have, you know, perfect. Uh, I mean, not perfect, but most of the time you'll have one or two vessels out, you know. So uh, I'm sorry, one or two vessels back, you know. And then you come back and you do the surgery, basically. That's an, just an example of. Uh, so if there's no outflow and the motor function is okay. I think it's worth trial at least to do TPA, you know. You know, not, no, I agree, no, I agree with that. Uh, that I agree with. Um, but what you're doing is you are intending to, to lyse the distal thrombus in the tibial vessels. You don't just lyse the popliteal artery, and, and if you don't get uh, any runoff, you don't leave it at that. You go after the distal vessels. Um, if you can, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's it. And then because if you go in surgically on thrombose popliteal aneurysms, clearing out the tibial vessels with, a, with a, an embolectomy catheter, et cetera, is, is difficult. It's unrewarding. They do a lot better. If you lyse everything, get everything flowing again. And, and the other thing is you don't know which is the tibial vessel that the popliteal aneurysm is running into because they will often have knocked off one or two of their crural vessels prior to the final vessel thrombosing um, as they distally embolize. So this will tell you what the runoff vessel is that you can bypass onto. Um, so, so yes, but, but, but I think I understood Sam's question to mean, can you lyse proximally and accept distal thrombotic occlusion of your runoff. Is that right, uh, Samir? Is that when you put the catheters, the, the, you know, the blood, you open the blood where it's around the catheter and maybe approximately one or two centimeters after that. But yeah. this you have to have something open to get the things open. If everything is occluded, even if you put TBA at the tibia, the catheters, like you put in the bobliteal and you have TBA is occluded, how is this TBA is going to be open? How, you know, we, how... to, you, we do an angiogram at 12 hours and reposition the catheter. Uh, okay. this have yeah. to reach and go down all the way to the tibia. Yeah, and go, yeah. yeah. And you have to run after all this tibia. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I think it's maybe the last questions. Um, Hamad Dahman, I saw you here. Hamad, you want to read this one? I think he's just dropped out. <laughs> uh, Mumpin, let's continue, Ahmad. Yes, please. During thrombolytic therapy for per, for uh, peripheral arterial occlusion, the most common frequent is puncture site. Okay. Bleeding. All right. I think uh, what happened here is they said after 70... Continue. Well, this it was scenario. Okay. After 72 hours of thrombolysis, there was still residual thrombus in the right hypogastric artery and external iliac artery origins. Because of concerns of uh, pelvic ischemia and residual thrombus in the left hypogastric artery, Efforts were made to preserve the right hypogastric artery. The right hypogastric artery occlusion legion, occlusion legion was traversed from the left groin. The right groin was accessed and second wire was positioned across the right external iliac artery. From, from this position, opposing self-expanding stent were placed at the origins of both external and internal iliac arteries, restoring perfusion to the right lower extremity without embolization. The patient had palpable pedal pulses complete at the completion of the procedure in the postoperative period. A transesophageal echocardiogram documented a cardiac thrombus as the source of aortic iliac embolization. She was discharged on anticoagulation. Um, 
There is no question that is done here, but I don't like this approach. I know you can ask, we can talk about it. Uh, I will not do that. I don't like with stent. I think I'll do open thrombectomy because all this chronic clot, maybe I'll put it out with the open with the Fogarty. And then I'm putting two stent in this area. I don't know. What do you think, Isa or Mohammed? Think this is a good approach? I don't like this way to put two stent. We still have a clot. Why well, just make small incision and pull this clot out? This is a chronic yeah, clot. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think uh you know, this is a uh, surprise that actually this doctor, Dr. Keshav, I know him, you know, he's a case Western, but <clears throat> I'm surprised that uh, he did this, but I would probably did the two, two catheter first. And then if you don't have good results, you should open and do a thrombectomy. Yeah. And yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, this is uh, not a good way of doing this uh, treatment up and over. You don't have control. You don't have good uh, uh, thrombolysis there, but... Uh, I have an interesting question for you. Mm -hmm. If you had known that this patient has intracardiac thrombus from the very start, <laughs> would you have still, would you have still thrombolyzed? Well, probably, probably, probably would get a CT surgery consult first, and uh, that will change your management. You know, probably I would thrombolize this patient because you can't thrombolize him after open heart surgery. You know. Uh, but that highlights, you know, the workup. Every patient with acute limb ischemia should get an echocardiogram. You know, that's uh, uh, it's or a, a most CT, common or a CT or a CT, or CT, or CT scan. Yeah, yeah. That's we've, why. We've that's done, yeah. We've they done were done photography, didn't they? Yeah, they. Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not really surprised about the management of this. wasn't perfect, you know. But every person should get a. a Good history, especially if them you have to do echocardiogram on everybody. If the echo is negative, then I go far even I do CTA of the chest because sometimes you have thrombus in the aortic, uh, uh, in the in the uh, aortic arch. Even I've seen that before, or it's in the aorta, you know. So you get CTA of the chest, and if that's negative, then you probably incite with thrombosis, or you have to figure out. Where yeah. the thrombus is coming from? Yeah, I mean, our protocol for acute limb ischemia is they get a CT from the chest all the way down. So we get the heart as well. We look for a clot in the appendix, and we look at the ascending and descending aorta all the way down. So, so we, you know, uh, that should be routine for us. Um, mm -hmm. The other question I wanted to ask you, Sam, it is we're seeing. Uh, I mentioned in the group we're seeing a lot of patients with um, free floating aortic thrombus, non occlusive, with distal embolization. Okay. Would you consider yeah. thrombolysis in these patients, or would you be afraid that you might lyse the, the, the you know the aortic thrombus and embolize it? Go right. ahead. Fine, Ahmed. Well, depends on the location. So let's say you know uh, you have a patient with a free floating thrombus above the celiac. You know you don't want to yeah. thrombolyze that for sure. You know so sometimes you have to go and put a clamp and just take it out when you have something like that. You know. Um, I've done a case I learned the hard way back in the day. I put a T-bar for somebody, and it was not <laughs> because it was the people do that, but it was it was complication with mesenteric ischemia. So I had to go in and do embolectomy and so forth. So if I have a free, free floating thrombus, if it's an infrarenal, you can either do you know you can probably lyse that or you can do it open. But if it's above the celiac, for sure, that's not something that you want to. In my book now, I don't even do TVAR. Even though people do TVAR for that, I think it's not a good way to do it. And I think you're probably just going to open them up and take it out, you know. If you, Sam, if you have... Yeah. I think when you have non occlusive clot, it's very difficult to do thrombolysis because all the thrombolysis will go down the legs, you know, uh, because non occlusive clot. So I don't think this will work. I think it's risky. Uh, if it's asymptomatic, usually we leave them alone. And most of the time, when you do CT scan later on, they disappear. Right. I know. No, no, no. If they present, if they present with uh, with distal embolization, either uh, uh, we've, we've had visceral ischemia, we've had uh, four or five, one yesterday, one last week with uh, with lower limb ischemia. So does that does the present and, and and the typical place for it, the commonest place is the distal descending aorta above the celiac. That's where it's often sitting. Um, right. And uh, the abdominal aorta is unusual. Um, I mean, the, the abdominal aorta you can get with the Fogarty. It's easy. Um, but you, you have to revascularize the leg. You're dealing with a 2B. Um, and in young people with distal sludge and, and in tibial vessels, I would 
that ironically for me would be a good thrombolysis patient um, uh, because you know they've got normal arteries and you get good result, but you've got this clot sitting in the aorta. Yeah, but it's not conclusive. So if you put a if you put a catheter there and you get TBA, you don't think all TBA will wash down? You think it will stay there because it's not occlusive. The clot is just on the side, and you give a TBA. No, but the TPA uh, gets into the systemic system. I mean, you know, I'm talking about lysing the lysing the limb, not the aorta. Lysing the no. limb. Sorry, so the limb. Did, Sorry. Okay. We did some. I mean, I can I tell you what we do now. You know, for this, but uh, so if you talk to Safi, you know, Azim Safi, like he would definitely do. I asked him about a case like that before, and he said just do it open. But now, you know, we do we do angiovac, you know, but that's probably beyond this. Uh, the stock here, you know, there's a high caliber suction device that you do, you know, and you have to put them on a bypass and things like that. You can do angiovac and you can suck it out, you know, if it's acute, you know, so in that location. But you also have to be very careful, you know, because I mean, I think for board purposes, you probably have to take it out, you know, surgically if it's at, on the celiac level, because there's a really good good chance of getting um, embolization. And a lot of people do TVAR for these too, you know. I won't do it because I had a complication before do, just doing this, you know. So. so when you talk about surgical, you're talking about going from the groin with embolectomy or open the aorta? No, no, open the chest and just put a clamp and take it out, you know. From the chest? Yeah. Because they want to embolize to the SMA. SMA, okay. SMA and... I've had, I've done TR for one case like that, and I had a acute SMA, you know, uh, embolus after that, and, uh, and we had yeah, to go in and take it out, you know. And um, luckily, the patient did okay. But I've asked, I've asked, you know, Doctor Safi, I've asked him, you know, what what best way to do it, and he was adamantly said just you have to do it open. And he's, you know, he's done thousands by your list, you know, before. Yeah, that's Hazim Safi. Um, Hazim uh, Safi. Hazim yeah. Safi is really good. You can call him at any time. He's a very good guy, you know, very good. Uh, I train, I know him very well, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, our approach is we leave the free-floating descending thoracic thrombus alone, and we try to revascularize the limb surgically as best we can. We might give some TPA into the crural vessels a little bit, you know, to help along, but uh, we don't go after the thrombus in the chest. Uh, I don't know whether we need to change that, maybe. And we have had disappointments where you do a great uh, revascularization and they embolize again. Um, no, uh, I don't put uncovered stent like the cook we use for dissection. Can we do that? No, I don't think, you know, I think if you want to do stent, it has to be covered because the clot still goes through the uncovered portion of it, you know. But then, you know, manipulation of wires and catheters and probably my problem is, you know, if I do a case like that next time, I wouldn't do angiograms. You know, I did an angiogram before and you do it under pressure, and you know, you maybe some of that clot goes down. But uh, people do TVAR for this all the time as well, you know. But I I've, I didn't have good experience with it, and you know, um, and open is maybe it's a big case, but it's really it's not. You don't have to put them on bypass. It's just very quick, you know. So to do it, if you if you do it, you know. Whereas patient has a TVAR from trauma about ten years before he came to us. And for some reason, he continued to embolize to his legs, and we have to take from back to him every time. We never find a reason. Finally, we did a CT angiogram, and that time we found the T var is just lying with a clot. For some reason, I don't know why. And yeah, that's so we went there with other T var inside it, and since that yeah. time, yeah, that's a reportable case. That's probably you should report it. You know, if you have time to write these things. So I think sometimes it happens. Uh, but also I can think about like, instead of opening the chest, do open thrombectomy from below. If something happened, embolize, you can always open and do thrombectomy, even for right. mesenteric. You, know, you, can, you, can, you can do that, you know, or you can do angiovac. Now what the cardiologist does even for right. the heart clot, so a lot of times they would go with angiovac. You know, it's a very high caliber 26 French uh, catheter that, you know, you suck all that fluid. And before the clot retriever came on for DVT, severe DVT, they used angiovac. We use that now and still without risk, you know, so uh, still like, uh, not without risk, I mean, but it's probably better than open the chest, but uh, yeah. But I, you know anybody, Mohammed, who's using penumbra for that? To suck it out? I mean, penumbra, you can, you can use penumbra, you can use, you know, uh, penumbra, but the penumbra, the only problem is this, you really bleed a lot, you know, with these things and you don't have a bypass backup, you know, and you bleed a lot. I mean, you, you, you probably... Um, that's the only problem with penumbra. You can, 
I think he can, but it's just the bleeding. Even because, the new pandemic. I mean, they use it for, for, the, for the pulmonary emboli with good results. Um, and I yeah. suppose the pulmonary, the pulmonary uh, you know... Um, but it's more focal probably in the pulmonary system, you know, the clot. It's just, uh, you know, you don't need to suck as much, you know, when a big gold clot in the decent uh, aura. I mean, the only one time we have a similar like case like that, and as you said, I have to put a T-var, but I was surprised when you do an angiogram, I cannot see the clot, the angiogram, because it's a floating clot. So I have to use an eye to find it. And they put yeah. You don't see them. You know where you're going to put your T-var. The other problem is uh, it's often not that far away from the celiac. Um, um, you know, so you, you'll you often either have to cover the celiac or yeah. um, accept a short a short distal landing zone. Yeah. Right. Anyway, okay, guys, thank you very much. I really appreciate your presence here today. You see, guys, your presence made a huge difference in the discussion. And thank you very much. And yeah. see you next week. We'll see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thanks. Everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Well done, guys. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Oh, shit.